this morning is, I don't know, this might be the last in the series of the toolbox. I don't know yet. Um, but I want to speak about a word called rest. Rest. Now, rest incorporates the physical aspect of rest because we need it. God built that into his plan. He didn't need the Sabbath rest. God didn't lose any of his power when he created everything. You realize that, right? Whatever the greatest miracle is in the Bible, let's just say, let, I'll just throw out the parting of the Red Sea. God didn't part the Red Sea and then say, Phew, I am exhausted. I need a break. The reason God established a uh, Sabbath is not because he needed a break, but he understood we would need a break. And if we didn't take a break, we would break. And I see in a, a lot of times, and sometimes I fall into this myself, that we live such hectic and complicated lives with so much going on sometimes that we live our lives, unfortunately, exhausted all of the time. God has something better in store for you than just exhaustion, just barely making it through. There's a physical aspect to rest. What I want to spend most of the time, though, is on the spiritual aspect of rest. Because if the spiritual aspect of rest is in proper place, then everything else in life will take care of itself. And here's how this works. If you don't keep the Sabbath, then you're not going to have time to do everything that you sh think you should do. If you do keep the Sabbath, somehow God works things out. When we put God first, we begin to realize, well, not everything else is as, is as important as we thought it was, but the more we elevate our activity above God and his commandments, then the busier and more hectic and more crazy our life is. Now, there are times in our life that are just, you know, just busy. I totally get that. But there are times in our life, and crisis brings that. I totally get that. But there are times where we need to learn to just rest physically and spiritually. I love my cell phone. I, I, I hate to admit how much I love my cell phone. Uh, I have it here with me today. And the reason I have it up on the pulpit is because I set a timer for my sermon. So you should also love my cell phone today. <laughs> I love the people that I can connect to. I, I love to have the tasks in there so I don't have to remember. Some of you know this about me. Some of you don't, but I love to take selfies of myself and then send them to people. Probably most of the people in the church that, that get my sense of humor have a picture of me somewhere on their phone uh, because I just thought it was funny. And I would sit in my office and think of somebody and I thought, hmm, wonder if they have my picture. And, and if I thought that they didn't, I would take a <laughs> selfie and, and just send it to them. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping they're laughing, you know, like, like with me and not at me, but I don't know. What they, do, what they do with that gift from there, they are now the stewards of that selfie. We'll sit in meetings. I don't know if I've ever done this to Carl or not, but we're sometimes in meetings together, and sometimes the meetings run long. We talk about, <laughs> yeah, you know, right? We talk about in preaching, land the plane land the plane. And you can see it, and hopefully there'll be a progression in my sermon today that you get, you know, I'm getting ready to about land the plane. I was in a meeting this week. It was already a two-hour meeting, Zoom meeting. And the facilitator was landing it, and then they took off again. <laughs> so Dora was at home. I was in my office, and I, I sent her a, a message. This isn't serious, Okay. Please come to my office and shoot me <laughs> because I don't think I can do this any longer. But anyway, Carl and I have been in meetings together, and I don't know if I've done this to him or not, but I'll sit in the back because we, we'll host things here at our church, and ministers from all over South Jersey will come, and I know the meeting is getting long, so I'll take a selfie of me sitting in the back in the pew and send it to friends of mine that I know are sitting closer to the front. Have I ever done that to you, Carl? I'm going to. Yeah, yeah. When you're leading worship one of those days, that'll be me. You'll know. You'll know that it's from me. But I love my cell phone. I love taking pictures, sending texts. I love Facebook posts. I use it every day, sometimes too much. But there's an important fact about my cell phone that's so very important. If I don't recharge it, it becomes useless. 
Can I tell you something else? If you don't get recharged, you are not able to accomplish what God has called you to do. Have you ever reached for your cell phone and needed it for something and there's only 1% battery? I think that sometimes there are opportunities in life that God presents to us and we've lived life in such a way that there's only 1% battery left. Rest. Rest is part of the promise of God. And again, when we have spiritual rest in place, physical rest often takes care of itself. There's a scripture that Jesus uses. It's a familiar one. Uh, Part of it is behind us. And he says this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Take my yoke, and again, that my there is a contrast word, which I'll explain, upon you and learn from me, for I, again, there's a contrast taking place here, am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yours. Does anybody know the rest of it? Souls. Jesus understood that when we have rest in our souls, then everything else will take place care of itself. For my yoke is easy and my burden is, okay? I think it's possible that if we live our lives like this because of the stress and everything that's going on around us, we might have missed something along the way, okay? Now, are there, again, are there times in life where we're particularly going through a difficult time? Yes, I've gone through stresses and pressure here with things that have happened uh, years ago, decades ago now, that were so stressful that I literally found myself hunched over. And for that time period, that's the way it was. But God gave me strength through all of that, and I'm learning to find my rest in him. I want to look at this passage in particular because we can live our lives depleted, discouraged, diminished, in a word exhausted, instead of rested and at rest. Now, rest doesn't mean sleeping all day, although it includes sleep. Rest rest means this. We work hard, we do the best we can, and then we relax knowing that God can do what we can't. Now, for some today, you have to find that point because you haven't been able to find the point of I've done all I can do. You live life in I've got to do more, I've got to do more, I've got to do more. God created in six days and on the seventh day he rested. If God can rest, you can rest. But you have to find that point that that pierces perfectionism to be able to say I've done the best I can and I have to let God do what I can't. Rest means I can't do everything, therefore I shouldn't do everything. Rest means I need a break or I will break. That's what rest is. I wanted to examine this thought today by suggesting three mistakes that we can make and then offering hope through Jesus Christ. There's three mistakes we can make in these three scriptures that I read for you today. We can look in the wrong place for rest. We can try to find rest, but we learn from the wrong people. And thirdly, we lean on the wrong partner. So we look in the wrong place. We learn from the wrong people. We lean on the wrong partner partner. So let's take a look at first of all, and I'm going to turn it into a positive, looking in the right place, looking in the right place. There are two ways that people try to find rest for their souls because every soul is restless until Jesus fills that gap there. That's a little take on Augustine, not a very good one, but he does go back that far. All of us are looking for rest, and people try to find rest in different ways. The first way that I'm going to mention today is through religion. Religion is the opposite of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Today is Reformation Day. Martin Luther, who was a a childhood friend of Pastor Rick on this day, (laughs) posted on the wall his thesis and the Reformation The Reformation began, and it, it, we carry forth this idea, um, the Bible alone, grace alone, 
Christ alone, faith alone, and all for the glory of God, the five points of the Reformation. But people have tried to find rest for their souls through religion. Maybe Adam and Eve were first and they had a religion built on themselves. Certainly Cain had a false religion that he didn't want to obey what God asked him to do. He wanted to do what he wanted to do the way he wanted to do it and therefore force God to accept his sacrifice, placing himself above the one true God. The Tower of Babel and the people of Babel first uh, definitely had a false religion. In fact, we carry the idea of Babel to Babylon all the way through to Revelation based on falseness, false religion. What was their false religion? Their false religion was they wanted to glorify themselves more than they wanted to glorify God. They built this tower in disobedience to God. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. They said, we're going to stay here and build this tower to make a name for ourselves. See, that's false religion. And then we find a man in the New Testament his name is Nicodemus. If you have watched the series, The Chosen, what a tremendous uh, actor and what a tremendous part that Nicodemus plays in, in that. Just amazing. But if we were to offer to God the epitome of humanity, Nicodemus would be the man. If we were going to say, God, here's the best that humanity has to offer, we would offer Nicodemus. He was born to the right family. He was, had the right education. He was powerful. He was wealthy. He followed the law. He was conservative in all of his beliefs. And yet Jesus looked him in the eye in John chapter 3 and said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you you must, you must, you must be born again. I learned that scripture as a child in a kid's crusade. If you're from my generation, you remember kid's crusades. We didn't do VBS at our church. We did a kid's crusade, which someone would come in as a child evangelist, and they would do the whole thing. There was a lady. Actually, her name was Holden, Mrs. Holden. I just remembered that. I didn't remember it at our online service. And she came in and she taught this scripture. But when I learned it, we only had the King James for the most part. And so the wording here is very truly, I tell you. Does anybody know what the King James says? Verily, verily. See, you learned it like that too. Verily, verily. Uh, uh, to enter the kingdom of God, whatever the King James Version is, you must be born again. I never forgot that from when she taught it when I was a little kid in Kids Crusade. So I was in college, and we were driving through Pennsylvania. Uh, my parents were behind me. They had come. It must have been when I was moving back for the summer or something like that, and I saw a guy hitchhiking, and I pulled over and picked him up. Stop. Don't ever do that. I can't even imagine what my mother was thinking in the car behind me. She, she, was, she watches our online services, and she remembered the whole story. She's going like this, like this. You know, raising four boys, how she's lived as long as she has, I have no idea. But I picked this guy up, and I was in Bible school, and, and we start talking, and it starts sharing where I'm headed and where he's from. And he was obviously... Um, not living the life that might have been pleasing to the Lord, okay? And we started talking. Don't you know that that lady, Mrs. Holden, was his aunt? And we, when we narrowed it down to where I lived and where we were going, it gives me chills. And so when it was his time to stop at whatever exit he wanted to, to stop at, I had a Bible in my car, and I gave him that Bible, and I prayed with him. And I thought all the way back to Mrs. Holden when I was a kid. Who knows? what God can do. Who knows what God can do? I really look forward to seeing him in heaven someday. In heaven someday. Awesome. That verse, you must be born again. Here's what Jesus was saying. I know you've got this religion thing all set, and I know that you keep the laws and you kind of make up laws too, but that's not enough. You must, you must be born again. Because Jesus understood that Nicodemus, although he knew a lot was restless in his soul. And Jesus knew that Nicodemus would not find rest through religion. And he told him, you must be born again. It was to Nicodemus that he said, uh, uh, for God so loved the world that he uh, gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's Nicodemus. 
He's telling him the way to rest is not through religion and rules and ritual. It's through believing and a relationship with Jesus. And then Jesus went on to say, I didn't come to condemn people because the world is already condemned. To move out of this condemnation, you have to believe. See? And people try to find rest through religion. And listen, we can even do that in our circles by thinking we have to do more to prove our love to God or to get God to love us. We can fall into this trap of constant motion and spinning wheels sometimes and never accomplish anything, but at least, at least we're busy. At least we're busy. I don't know where or when busyness became uh, such an important value and character trait. What I'm finding, and maybe as I get older, just physically can't do all that I used to be able to do, but what I'm finding spiritually is even more important than being busy and trying to prove my effectiveness is finding rest in Jesus Christ. Finding rest in him. Religion is the first way that people try to find rest for their souls, but a religion never leads them in the right direction. Instead, it leads, well, quickly. Oh, wow, real quick. I blame Carl. Um, uh, religion can lead to two things, pride, thinking we've made it, or despair, thinking we'll never make it. That's why religion never works. Number two, in, under the first part, looking in the wrong place, is relationships. If we now go to John chapter 4, Nicodemus was the epitome of humanity. John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman was at the other end of it. She had been uh, married multiple times. She was living with someone that wasn't, wasn't her husband. She was born into the wrong family. In those days, born to the wrong gender. She was a woman in a male-dominated world. She made wrong choices on her own. She was an outsider, an outcast, not an insider. And she was restless in her soul, and she looked to find rest for her soul in relationships. And it never worked. So she married the first time, the second time, the third time, fourth, and on and on to try to find rest for her soul. And it had left her depleted, disillusioned, discouraged, desperate. But Jesus was on his way and he was traveling. He said, fellas, I'm going to go through Samaria. And his guy said, what, are you crazy? And Jesus saw an outcast, an outsider by birth, by gender, by choice. And he said, I've got to talk to her. And he knew everything about her. And here's what he said to her. Everyone who drinks of this water, they'll be thirsty again. Because she was thirsty. She was thirsty, spiritually thirsty. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I don't know if you know this, but the first time he ever told anyone he was actually the Messiah, the one they were all looking for, Samaritan woman. Didn't tell Nicodemus, told the Samaritan woman. And you know what she found in Jesus? Rest that she no longer had to worry about relationship with men or if you're a man, a relationship with a woman. She no longer had to worry about that because she found the most important relationship was a relationship to the Messiah, to Jesus. And so what did she do from there? She went and told everybody else that were also weary and burdened, exhausted and seeking. She shared the rest the rest that she receives. See, we need to stop looking in the wrong places and start looking at the right Savior, and his name is Jesus, and he said this, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Number two, rest comes from learning from the right people. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, Jesus said. I'm gentle and humble. The, the yoke this yoke in a physical sense were the oxen and they were yoked under this heavy wood uh, harness and then usually a plow would be attached to it and they would march along and the farmer 
uh, farmer would lead them and they would plow the fields with this. And what they would do is they would put a, an older ox together with a younger ox and the older one would teach and they could lean on them. What Jesus is relating here was not about the harness. What he was relating here was the harshness of the law that the people had grown up with. Because what the religious leaders did over thousands of years is they took the law of God and then added to it. Now, quickly, you have to understand that God gave the law not for humanity to follow, but to show humanity that they could never follow the law, therefore they need a savior. That was the purpose of the law. See, that's why, catch this please, huge, huge. The Ten Commandments came after their deliverance, not before. We're not saved by following the Ten Commandments. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And then he gives us a way that we should live to glorify him. We get that mixed up. I'll follow the Ten Commandments and maybe God will accept me. Religion, relationship, he already loves us and delivered us. Therefore, I want to live for him. Huge difference. So the Pharisees and the religious leaders made up all these laws that no one could ever follow. They would just make them up, write them down. I mean, there were volumes full, cell phones full of laws. And they put this yoke on people. Watch what it says in Acts 15. Now then, why do you test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe, watch this, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. All who come to Jesus are saved. Jesus was saying this to those that were weary and burdened, trying to find rest, that were overburdened by the yoke. Stop learning from the wrong people and start learning from the right person. Now, we've never had more access to teaching than what we have now. You can flip on. I don't know if people listen to the radio anymore. I have satellite radio uh, myself. Um, you can, the TV, the internet, YouTube, uh, Roku, and there are teachings on everything that you could possibly imagine. And I want to help you weed through all of the teaching so you're listening to the right people. Here it is. Are they teaching the word of God above all else? Or are they teaching their own revelation above all else? Okay? Because someone can say they heard from God, but does it line up with the word of God? See, I, I come from a perspective, although I believe in words from the Lord, I believe I don't seek word, a word. I seek the word. And then he shares a word that sometimes is confirmed by other people. Anyway, that's a long story there, are they? And it, it really is that simple. If you're listening to a preacher in, in, in a half hour, 45 minute hour time or whatever, and they never get to the word, I'm just saying be careful. I just thought of this earlier as I was sitting down there. Be careful also of people that give themselves titles. Now, this might be a little nasty. I get it. But it's Pastor Appreciation Day. I'm going to use that for everything today. I'm an apostle. I'm a prophet. I'm a this. I'm a that. 55 years of life, I've never heard anybody say, I'm a servant, other than Paul, Jesus. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. Be careful of those that give themselves a title. Sometimes the title fits, and I get that, and other people help with that. But anybody that gives themselves a title, please, please be very careful of are they lifting up Jesus or are they lifting up themselves? If they're giving themselves titles, there's a good chance that there might be other motivation there. Learn from the right people. Can I tell you this as well? 
like that was a rhetorical question if you didn't get that. Like I wasn't asking your permission. I was going to say it anyhow. But, you know, there are greater and much better preachers out there than I am. And I listen to some of them. They're phenomenal. But, you know, we need to hear from our own pastor. And there's no substitute from hearing from our own pastor who knows us, does life together. They're great. I mean, unbelievable communicators. And I listen to them too because I want to be nurtured in spirit. But there's a time where you just need somebody that is heard from, hopefully, uh, you know, has heard from God, has chewed it up for just our church. I, uh, online, you know, we have people that listen, uh, you know, from outside our, our region. But I'm just a local pastor at a local church that loves his church, that's so thankful to be here to minister to the almost, the, you know, the same people week in and week out, and you keep coming hearing me preach week in and week out, but there's a dynamic there that takes place that's not going to happen by flipping through the channels all the time. Sometimes we just need a pastor. We just need that. Be careful who you're listening to. Focus on Jesus. Let the teaching of God's word get into your heart, or else there's no rest for the weary. Number three, rest comes from leaning on the right person. Leaning on the right person. That's the yoke. We work together in this. As I mentioned, a farmer would yoke an older ox to a younger one. The younger would learn from the older. Uh, the older maybe would shoulder most of the burden until the younger one was able to. But be careful if you ever want to find rest. Don't lean on yourself. Doesn't Proverbs teach that? And lean not on your own understanding, right? Don't lean on yourself, your ability, your wisdom, and your knowledge. I've done that through life and ministry. It's exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. Every emotional turn and turmoil that you could ever live through publicly, I have been through. And most of it was because I was leaning on my own gifts and my own understanding and my own ability and my own knowledge. Pray for me as I'm learning to lean on a better partner, Jesus. Don't lean on your spouse, they're not Jesus. How many know for a fact your spouse is not Jesus? Cowards. You're all cowards. All cowards. Don't you say a bad thing about my friend Bobby back there. Bobby listens online just for the meme of the week. Don't lean on yourself. Don't lean on others. Don't lean on your spouse. Don't lean on me. Lean on Jesus. And I'm going to start to land that plane. If one of our staff is ever preaching and you see me in the back going like this, that means land the plane. The people are ready to get off. They've reached the destination. But they can't do that to me. You see how that works? I'm just teasing. So my dad... A lot of you knew him, and you've heard me talk about him. He was just a great man of God. He retired at 56 years old. And when I, I was in my early 20s, and I thought that was old. I'm 55. <laughs> he retired. And he taught me things like, like God's word is either true or it's not. And when he was thinking about retiring, I mean, he had to more wisdom and understanding than I did. At 20, you think, oh, 56, you only got a couple good years left. <laughs> he realized he had many years ahead and he was taking an early retirement and nothing was guaranteed. And, but he said to me over a, a dinner at a restaurant named Longo's where I ordered ravioli, I remember it. That's a fact, really. He said, the Bible is either true or, or it's not. God is either going to provide for our needs or his word isn't true. 
And if you talk to my mom, she's 90 years old. My dad has passed on. She keeps telling me. Now, they didn't have a lot of money or anything like that. We weren't wealthy, but we had everything we needed. My mom lives on a limited income. She says, I have more than enough. Because we always ask the brothers, I'm the youngest, do you have everything you need? What do you need? Can we help? Ah, oh, the Lord has been so good. I have everything I need. What I found out is she doesn't need as much because she's been so generous through the years. You catch that? The more we're able to give, the less we need. All right, that's a story for another time. But here's, here's a song that was one of my dad's favorites, and I don't usually sing a cappella, but maybe you'll know it. It fits in well, and I'm going to read a poem. Make sure you're leaning on the right partner. We used to sing this song. I'm learning to lean, learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on. Right, see the difference there? I'm finding more power than I've ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. Look, we can look at three things that would lead us to a restless life. We can look in the wrong places. We can look to religion or other relationships. We can learn from the wrong people that aren't pointing us to Jesus. And we can lean on the wrong partner. But when we get all of that in order, see how all these points lead to Jesus? Did you catch that? Who should we follow? Jesus. Who should we listen to? Jesus. Who should be our partner? Jesus. That's when you find rest. That's where at the end of the day you can take a deep breath and say, Lord, maybe I didn't get everything done. I wanted to, need to, but I'm just going to rest in you. Lord, I've done the best I can today, and I'm going to leave the rest in your hands. Lord, I don't know what to do. That it seems if I look to the right, that's not right. To the, the left, that's not going to work. Forward, backward, none of that's going to work. I just, I don't know, but, 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 but you know, and I just need your help. And we can literally and figuratively lower our, lower our shoulders and say, you know, it's good to be at rest. He gives us rest at salvation. He gives us rest through the sanctification process, and we will be at rest when we are glorified for all eternity because of Jesus Christ. Listen to this poem from Phil Simmons. Rest is not lying in soft beds of ease, free from all labor with no one to please. Rest is not quitting, no burden to bear. Rest is reclining in heart on his care. Rest can be found in trouble and pain when dark clouds are gathered and threatening rain. Rest is relief found in, the dark, in life's darkest hour to know he is with us and we are held by his power. Rest is not found in fulfilling our dreams. Dreams often vanish, hopes lost, so it seems. Rest is the promise our Lord made to all who faithfully trust him refusing to fall. There remains a sweet rest for the people of grace who enter that rest while seeking his face. This life so uncertain can never destroy the rest that is found when his will we enjoy. Rest is secured, the hour of believing. Today you may enter his will now receiving. His yoke now is easy. The burden is light. He draws near to comfort and steady your plight. Rest comes the moment you answer his call. Depend on him fully. No worry at all. Rest settles the mind. Anxiety none. With love now abiding, the victory is won. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand together.